So good morning, my name is Hilary Bagshaw, as um, just heard. I'm a clinical assistant professor of radiation at Stanford here in Palo Alto, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you about radiation. Uh, so what is radiation therapy anyway? Um, you've heard a little bit from my colleague, Dr. Chen, but I'm gonna go into some uh, more details here, hopefully. Um, so radiation is a curative curative intent treatment for prostate cancer. There are two main ways to deliver this treatment. One is external and one is internal. Um, external radiation can be delivered with either photons or protons. You may hear about this if you read about prostate cancer. There are many different terms that I have listed here. These are mostly technical terms that refer to the way radiation is delivered. Uh, but you may come across them when you're reading about prostate cancer or looking online. Internal radiation, also called brachytherapy, is delivered with a small radioactive source or sources, depending on the type of brachytherapy performed. And in general, this involves placing the source inside the area to be treated, in this case, the prostate. And I'll talk more about this a little bit later. So treatment options for prostate cancer are mostly determined by your risk grouping, I think as you've heard already. We typically use the NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network defined risk groups. And these are based on clinical features to predict aggressiveness like tumor stage based on rectal exam, Gleason score based on biopsy, and PSA or prostate specific antigen level in the blood. On the right-hand side of this screen, you can see images to show how we clinically stage prostate cancer based on a rectal exam, and what we feel with a finger is the extent of disease in the prostate. The risk categories are broken down into three main groups, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Based on the risk categorization, we then determine what treatment options are right for you. Here I show each risk group, the definition of clinical features and the radiation treatment options. I want to note, as you've heard already, surgery is often a treatment option for patients, but in this talk I'm focusing on the nuances of radiation, so I've not included surgery here on this slide. And you can see that as the risk group increases, so does treatment intensification. For example, low risk prostate cancer patients can get radiation alone. Whereas a high-risk prostate cancer patient may be recommended to receive external radiation, internal radiation, and hormonal therapy. Radiation treatment courses tend to be prolonged over many weeks by spreading the radiation over multiple treatments, which we also call fractions. We're able to maximize tumor death from radiation, but minimize normal tissue side effects. In general, all of these different schedules are biologically equivalent with respect to radiation, dose, tumor control, and side effects. Depending on the technique utilized, the schedule is different. For example, there are many different ways to deliver external radiation shown in the red tones, either over eight weeks, six weeks, or one and a half weeks, depending on the technique. This is something that would be recommended to you by your radiation oncologist, depending on features like your risk group, treatment fields, are we treating the prostate or the prostate and lymph nodes, your current health state, like your urinary function, your sexual function, and other medical comorbidities. Currently, the eight-week schedule is um, more rarely used. That's kind of an older schedule, if you will. And we typically use the six week or the one and a half week treatment schedule for external radiation. And brachytherapy is typically performed over two sessions or one session if combined with external radiation. You can see in the upper right hand corner, generally treatments Monday through Friday once a day. For external treatments, it's typically on the order of 15 minutes your appointment time, although the treatment delivery is actually much faster than that. Um, stereotactic, the five treatment regimen over one and a half weeks, the appointment times are slightly longer. And then the brachytherapy, which I'll talk more about, is a longer procedure under anesthesia. So you may hear multiple different terms or names um, for linear accelerators that are used to deliver radiation. 
There are many different manufacturers and names of their machines as I show here. At Stanford, we have multiple different linear accelerators, including Varian machines, Accuray or CyberKnife machines, and ViewRay machines, and the Reflection. The ViewRay or the MR Linac and the Reflection are newer machines um, here at Stanford. Um, the MR Linac allows us to modulate treatments based on internal anatomy and the reflection uh, will allow us to deliver radiation based on PET imaging, um, but that's uh, kind of an in-process um, uh, study going on right now. Um, I thought it would be helpful to show a linear accelerator in action for those of you who've never seen one. So here's a video of two of our radiation therapists setting up a patient for treatment. So you can see how the room is very large and open and the machine moves around the patient to deliver the treatment. It's much like getting an x-ray once a day so you don't see or feel the treatment as you're getting it. So the goal of radiation is to deliver high doses of treatment to the target, in this case the prostate, and avoid radiation to other surrounding organs, in this case the bladder and the rectum. So we're able to do this either with external or internal radiation and there are advantages to both. So external beam radiation, again, as I mentioned, could be delivered with many different techniques. This slide is meant to show you the dose distribution with external radiation. The red depicts high doses of radiation. Um, and the blue depicts low doses of radiation. So as you can see with any of these external techniques, the high dose is concentrated in the center on the prostate, um, and there's some low dose surrounding that. This is because we have to get the external radiation in and out somehow. So there's a little low dose kind of spread around um, the other organs, but this is uh, what we learn as physicians in radiation oncology, how to make sure this is safe and yet still give um, the correct dose we want to the prostate. So brachytherapy or internal radiation is used for multiple different types of cancers. For example, prostate cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer, et cetera. For prostate cancer specifically, there's two different ways to deliver this and they're equally effective. So the low dose rate or LDR is where we permanently implant radioactive sources into the prostate and they decay over time. And high dose rate or HDR is where we temporarily insert a radioactive source in the prostate and then remove it. Here we offer the HDR uh, type of brachytherapy for prostate cancer. Now with brachytherapy, because the the radiation is delivered internally. There's really no entry or exit dose. So you can see that there's still some low dose around the prostate, but it's, it's kind of more contained uh, rather compared to the external radiation uh, treatment delivery. At Stanford for our high dose rate brachytherapy procedure, this, as I mentioned, is given under general anesthesia. It's about three hours in duration. Uh, we place needles into the prostate through the perineal skin, which is the skin between the scrotum and the anus under ultrasound guidance, which is, it's kind of similar to the um, biopsy. Um, and so the treatment itself is only takes about 10 minutes when the radioactive source is moving in and out of each needle to deliver the radiation from the inside. And once that's completed, everything is removed from your body so you wake up from the procedure without anything left over, but you've received the treatment. Um, patients go home the same day. You don't spend the night in the hospital. There's really no restrictions to you afterwards because you're not radioactive or anything like that. Um, here is the machine that controls the internal radiation source. It's called an afterloader. The radiation source goes from the machine through some catheters into the needles that are in the prostate. This is a picture trying to show um, kind of that uh, travel. Uh, it stays in the needles for a number of seconds, goes back into the machine, goes back into a different needle, and sits there for a number of seconds, and then, and then the treatment is complete. 
Short-term side effects from radiation are those that most patients experience at some point during their treatment. These include generalized fatigue and side effects to, due to irritation of the local organs. So for bladder irritation, typically people describe urinary frequency, urgency, having to get up more at night to urinate. For um, bowel irritation or rectal irritation, typically people describe looser stool or diarrhea. There's also late side effects, or, which are those that can show up months to years after completing treatment. These are less common and typically seen in a minority of patients, but they can include urinary urgency or perhaps needing to use a medication like Flomax to make your urinary stream stronger in the future. Um, and uh, cystitis is kind of a later inflammation of the bladder, which is relatively uncommon, but can cause some spasming, sometimes a little bit of bleeding due to scar tissue in the bladder from radiation. Proctitis is a similar um, manifestation of side effects in the rectum, where the rectum can have some late irritation. You can have sometimes urgency, mucus with stools, and occasionally blood in the stool. Again, these are relatively uncommon. Um, also, patients after radiation can describe erectile dysfunction, and often this is mitigated with um, you know, either oral aids or other um, uh, uh, type of erectile function um, enhancement. Second, cancers or cancers caused by radiation or in the radiation area, like a bladder or rectal cancer, years after radiation are, have been described. This is very, very uncommon, um, typically something that's seen 20 plus years after radiation, and even then it's very rare. Um, Anyway, the, the main point is that you know, we're still, patients are still at risk of getting erectal cancer anyway, so we want you to make sure you're doing screening for other cancers like colorectal cancer. Occasionally after surgery, we use radiation if on the pathology there are high risk features for recurrence or if the PSA starts to go up after surgery. So this is called adjuvant radiation if we're using it after surgery with a normal PSA, and it's called salvage if we're using it after surgery, if the PSA is uh, all of a sudden detectable or going up after surgery. In this setting, we only can give external radiation. We cannot give internal radiation because there's no prostate anymore. Um, and this typically is a treatment of over seven weeks, uh, once a day treatment for uh, 35 treatments total. And we typically give this with hormonal therapy, um, although this is kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. I just wanted to note some of the current trials we have enrolling in radiation oncology here at Stanford. The first one um, touches on Dr. Igaru's talk from earlier. We um, have a protocol where we're doing PET MRI imaging pre and post brachytherapy. The goal of this is to try to understand the imaging response of the prostate cancer in the prostate after brachytherapy. And the second one is just within the radiation oncology department. It's a biomarker diagnostic and predictive study where we're taking blood, urine, and hopefully tissue samples from patients pre and post radiation to try to identify possibly a better way to predict whether patients are responding to treatment better than the PSA or in conjuncture with the PSA, perhaps if someone's on hormonal therapy and the PSA is low, is there something else we can look for that can tell us if you're responding? And the final one is a national study that we're just opening in our department, which is uh, specifically for high-risk prostate cancer patients where we're uh, basing off of a decipher genomic risk score, which is what Dr. Chen, I think, mentioned briefly. We're randomizing patients to either intensification or deintensification of therapy based on the genomic um, risk. So those are uh, three uh, protocols we have available right now at, at our department. So thank you so much for having us, or me, <laughs> um, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions for you. So kind of um, a mixture of, of a couple questions. So how do you select the specific type of radiation modality for a patient? And then kind of a follow-up question is, the specific question is, why does Stanford prefer six weeks um, treatment over eight week for MIRT? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, IMRT. IMRT. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll just go back, sorry, to that kind of this slide. So. First of all, you know, the selection is based on your risk group. So sometimes, um, you know, for a low risk, we, we usually just do one type of radiation, either internal or external. And then within external, there's a couple different schedules, you know, as was mentioned, we, a week and a half, six weeks, eight weeks. Um, I guess to touch on the number of treatments question, Essentially, over time, we've been able, through randomized trials, com you know, enrolling half patients to a longer course, half patients to a shorter course, we've been able to show that the efficacy and the side effects are similar across different, what we call fractionation schedules or weeks of treatment. And, um, and so generally, for someone like with low risk or, or uh, intermediate risk cancer, um, the data has shown that like eight weeks is equivalent to six, five to six weeks, and then equivalent to one and a half weeks. So as long as patients have you know good health, good urinary function, kind of normal range size prostates, um, things like that, a certain clinical features, you kind of have all those options open to you. And so in general, we try to do it as you know the shortest duration as possible for convenience. Um, sometimes, you know, for certain clinical factors, you may not be a good candidate for the shorter uh, schedule, and so we may prolong it. I say in general, we don't do the eight weeks anymore just because there's a, a lot, a lot, a lot of data that shows that the eight weeks and the five to six weeks are pretty equivalent. So we've kind of transitioned, um, you know, to that schedule. Um, okay. Hopefully awesome. that answered that question. Yeah, I think it does. A couple kind of side effect um, management questions. Um, how many men get radiation cystitis and how would you treat it? Yeah, so cystitis is typically a late side effect. We think of this something that could show up months or years after radiation. We typically uh, would quote maybe five to 10% of patients that receive radiation could get cystitis. Um, there's kind of a range of clinical features, uh, but in general, this could include just you see a little bit of blood in the urine one time randomly, it stops on its own, uh, but we do want to know about it so that we can have a urologist look inside the bladder and make sure what's going on there. Typically, if it's cystitis, it stops on its own, and if they can see that it's just from irritation from radiation, we would just kind of, we wouldn't really do anything else. Um, the, you know, if there's spasm or things like that, sometimes we'd put you on a medication as like an antispasmodic, um, and rarely, rarely would you need like a surgical procedure to stop bleeding, for example, but that'd be very rare. Uh, can you do targeted brachy, like when you specifically target certain areas, or do you do that, or you That's a good question. Um, so I assume you mean just like a part of the prostate? Or you just target specific uh, lesion, which is high-grade lesion, and yeah. do something like that? Yeah, we typically do not do that in radiation. That would be like a focal therapy with brachytherapy, which I think Dr. Son talked about focal therapy uh, from like HIFU and things like that. The reason we don't usually offer that first line with radiation is because we walk this fine line between trying to give enough radiation to the prostate and not too much to the surrounding organs. And if we radiate part of the prostate because it's so small, we may kind of like use up, if you will, the dose constraints to the bladder and the rectum. And if prostate cancer recurred in another part of the prostate, uh, we would be more hesitant to offer radiation. So in, in, in any of these treatment modalities, we are radiating the whole prostate, no matter if there's just cancer on like one side or not. And it's pretty much because um, we don't want to have to come back if there, if there were to develop prostate in the other side. Then what is the advantage of doing breaking in, in external combined? 
um, brachytherapy and external radiation combined. Um, that has been shown in some more advanced cancers, higher grade, higher risk, to be more effective um, than one modality alone or external radiation alone specifically. So these are those are kind of specific nuances of a case-to-case -case basis. And then what's your targeted relapse rate after 10 years when you do that? It what? depends on the risk group, but like for low risk patients, relapses are on the order of 5%. Intermediate risk, we usually say maybe 15 to 20%, but that's a large mixed bag of patients. So um, it kind of, it's nuanced depending on each situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I go ahead and ask a question online. Can you go over, this was something um, asked earlier and deferred for you, uh, why radiation therapy for lung metastasis is recommended? That is, uh, what are the positive outcomes that were shown in studies for oleo, uh, oligometastatic prostate cancer and what risks are there? Sure, so as Dr. Chen mentioned, um, if the prostate cancer comes back just in one spot outside of the prostate, for example, in the lung or a lymph node or in bone, and it's just in a couple areas, as he mentioned, oligo means a few, three, four, something like that. Um, there's been randomized trials in not just prostate cancer, other cancers as well, where radiation using a stereotactic technique, which is a technique where we can give really, really high doses to small areas, um, is beneficial and it does provide a survival benefit. So typically um, in those situations, we will recommend radiation uh, to those uh, you know, oligometastasis. Um, it is uh, safe. Um, that's a whole another discussion about lung radiation. However, um, we're able to give that uh, very safely with minimal side effects. Mostly side effects are fatigue and sometimes some irritation of the lung tissue that can cause a transient cough. Okay, um, we have a few, we have five more minutes, so we have a, a few more questions. Um, what happens to the prostate if it needs to be removed after radiation? Um, so if a rare situation would be, you know, you got radiation, PSA went up afterwards, uh, we showed that there was just recurrent disease in the prostate only using like a PET scan and a biopsy of the prostate, then what do you do? There's a different options for salvage. One of them is salvage prostatectomy. Um, that would be more a question for the surgeons, but um, sometimes there can be just higher risk of side effects due to scarring from radiation. Um, and so I would kind of defer that conversation to them, um, but it's, it's kind of a, a rare situation that you may find yourself in. Um, and more, I think just more risk for side effects given to using two modalities of treatment, surgery and radiation compared to one. Thank you. A couple questions about hormonal therapy um, as, as, you know, in combination with radiation. Um, is hormonal therapy still um, advantageous for post radical prostatectomy with a PSA less than 0.2? <laughs> That's a very good specific question that um, I'd say is a little bit controversial even in the field of you know, prostate cancer and radiation oncology. Um, there are three randomized trials that have shown a benefit to adding hormonal therapy in the setting of a rising PSA after prostatectomy. Um, as you can imagine, there's a whole mixed bag of patients on those trials with PSAs either going from 0.1 all the way up to like five or higher, or something like that. So um, I'd say specifically for patients with PSA less than 0.2, um, it, it's a little bit controversial. Probably some people do benefit, and usually what we do is look at other risk features like you know, the pathology at the time of surgery, the grade of cancer, the PSA level, um, things like that, how quickly it's rising. So I don't think there, I don't think I could say, you know, one way or the other, but um, it's often we get, get into a little bit of a gray zone. Thank you. Okay, there's two questions, kind of a little bit unrelated, but they both um, include Baragel. Mm, okay. Can you speak when you use it, when you wouldn't? Sure. Um, is it necessary? Sure. So Baragel um, is a rectal spacer that's placed between the prostate and the rectum. 
using a transperineal approach or through the perineum. Uh, the goal of that, or something like Spaceor, you may have heard, uh, was a, a hydrogel also, a different uh, material, a different um, brand name. But these, the goal is to place something between the rectum and the prostate to move the prostate away from the rectum just by like a centimeter or so, just a little bit, to reduce the amount of radiation that's going to the rectum, because this is a really tight space that we're working in. Um, and so these materials do reduce the dose going to the rectum. Um, and it's, I think, in theory, it could reduce rectal side effects because not so much radiation is going to the rectum. Um, so we have used these types of materials uh, when we're using external radiation to try to min minimize some of the dose going to the rectum. We don't always use it because there are certain clinical features where it's contraindicated. Um, or in certain patients, it, because of anatomy, may not be optimal. Um, and because most of the randomized trials looking at all of these modalities did not use a rectal spacer, and the risk of rectal side effects is relatively low, um, we don't always use it. Um, but it is something you know we consider in patients. We'll take one last question from the audience, and then um, any other questions we'll just kind of... Dr. Um, Bezio, I want to double check uh, one thing. First of all, on the lutetium-177 with PSMA, uh, the FDA approved it, uh, the doctor said, on 21, about 21 June. Okay. Secondly, Stanford has been using it since 22 June. He said a few months ago. I, I interpret it for a few to me, three. Several seven, you three. Anyway, okay, so that double checks. Okay, second, uh, the spread is down 60% from the lutetium. So you're asking uh, some, yeah, so it sounds like you're asking some specific questions about lutetium or Puvicto. Yeah, so with, this, with PSMA, detected by PSMA. right. So this is a, so the question is about, I think, the efficacy of lutetium-177, which is a kind of PET-directed radio radiation treatment where a kind of radiation travels specifically to the area of cancer in the body. We typically, this is actually managed by our nuclear medicine department here. So as the radiation therapy department, we actually don't deliver this. Um, but uh, in general, we use this for more advanced disease right now. So it's not a, a treatment used for upfront definitive management of prostate cancer. Um, it's perhaps, you know, if things haven't worked or patients have metastatic disease, et cetera. Um, so I probably am not the best person to answer all those questions just because I don't deliver that treatment right now. No, I know, but I've read the, uh, the New England General Medicine uh, write-up of the uh, trial. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to, I know the numbers from that, but they, they said on the slide here that the spread was down 60%. So, and he said, yeah, that's, that's it. And then the dye is down 38%. That's what was on the slide. The dye. Oh, is that from Dr. From Dr. Yeah, from Dr. Igaro's talk? I don't want, I don't want to speak to that because I don't know exactly the data he put up there. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. I, oh, I have a quick question. Yeah. From your table, it looks like that you prefer here brachytherapy because it's in the high, in high risk and intermediate versus stereotactic uh, cyber knife approach. Can you comment on that? Because it seems like these guys can target lesions from outside and then use IMRT to do more uh, diffused. I mean, there is a reason that you prefer brachytherapy here at Stanford, or it's my own impression. Yeah, so we offer both modalities. I say we offer brachytherapy, we offer stereotactic radiation of the prostate alone, we offer external beam or IMRT, VMAT to the prostate and pelvis. Um, off, so there are certain circumstances where a patient would only be a candidate for one or the other, and this is typically based on a lot of clinical features or health states or um, other risk features, medical comorbidities. If you had, a, if somebody was, let's say they had a menu option, is what I usually say, of like these three different options, I would talk to them kind of about all three um, and kind of try to assess which one for them meets 
their goals. For example, some patients may not want anesthesia, and so maybe SBRT is better for them, or some patients may be coming from five hours away, so maybe brachytherapy is better for them, um, those kind of things. So when patients have the option of kind of all three things, uh, we try to at least just give you the information so that you can evaluate for yourself which one meets your goals or sounds most reasonable to you or the side effect profile is kind of most tolerable. Same thing when we compare radiation to surgery. We're having this kind of informed discussion we call shared decision making uh, because there are certain circumstances where we say you do have a lot of options and we're trying to help you decide what's best for you. may not be you know, us telling you, you have to do this one thing, for example. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was great. Okay, thanks, thanks. for having me.